Good morning. Let's try again. Good morning and sa happy Sabbath. Okay. I welcome everyone who is here today. I'm glad we are more normally we are 14, 15. Today we are 20 to start. That's a good sign. And I welcome uh, our brother, brothers who came to help us with the music. And I know John Hall for a long time, way back, when our kids was little kids, like four or five years old. Anyway, welcome, welcome, and welcome everyone. I miss you last Sabbath. I was not feeling good. I have back problems, but with God's grace, I, I am go back to work. And I'm glad to be here. And we have a beautiful lesson today. And we have a new teacher today. And we need to help him. We need to be a good student because he is prepared to be a good teacher. Thank you, Rob, for teaching today. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, in these moments we come before you to praise your name to thank you for helping us to be here with you, to worship you, to be in your presence, and to listen to your message. Thank you for everything you do for us, and we thank you for your son who was willing to die for us. Help us to understand the message today, and help us to do what is right, to do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, church. It's very good to be here with you in Sebastopol. It's always a pleasure. Is everyone ready to praise the Lord? <laughs> okay. Praise him in music this morning. Let's start off this morning. Uh, I don't know. That, maybe he does have it up here in the garden. Oh, he's got in the box. <laughs> well, pick up your uh, hymnals, if you will, and go to page 15. No, 47. Page 47. I apologize. Page 47. 487. I apologize. In the garden, 487. I have too many numbers up here, so little by little we'll work this out. 487. It was wonderful, I'm sure, when the Lord came in the garden and, and dwelt with his uh, first two beings that he made. And uh, he communed with them and spent some time with them there in the garden. And today we'll just sing about it. Okay. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The sound Joy we share as we 
tarry there none other has ever If you will, just turn right over to a page. Let me find it here. What was it? 633. Oh, 633. 633, yeah. Thank you, Larry. It doubles as a guitar pick. Yeah. Go back one here. When we all get to heaven... What a wondrous day that will be. Something to look forward to, for sure. Amen. <laughs> Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be When we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory While we walk the pilgrim's pathway Clouds of overspread the sky But when traveling days are over Not a shadow, not a sign when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in Will the trials of life repay When we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be When we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory Onward to the prize before us Very much.
morning. Happy Sabbath. It's been an interesting week for me. This time of year brings so much extra work at home, but I uh, always manage to get it done. Anyways, um, let's have a word of prayer before we start. Father in heaven, we would ask that you would bring your presence into this room and touch each heart and mind and help us understand what we're about to study. Speak through me, Lord, I pray that we all understand. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This week's study is Light Shines in the Darkness. I think it's a fascinating study, and um, I just want to start with a quote from Testimonies, Volume 5. Church and state are now making preparations for the future conflict. Protestants are working in disguise to bring Sunday to the front as did the Romanists. Throughout the land, the papacy is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions are to be repeated. And the way is preparing for the manifestation on a grand scale of those lying wonders by which, if it were possible, Satan would deceive even the elect. The decree which is to go forth against the people of God will be very similar to that issued by Azarias against the Jews in the time of Esther. The Persian edict sprang from the malice of Haman towards Mordecai, not that Mordecai had done him harm, but he had refused to show him reverence, which belongs only to God. The king's decision against the Jews was secured under false pretenses through misrepresentation of that peculiar people. Satan instigated the scheme in order to rid the earth of those who preserved the knowledge of the true God. But his plots were defeated by a counter power that reigns among the children of men. Angels that excel in strength were to protect the people of God and the plots of their adversaries returned upon their own heads. The Protestant world today see in the little company keeping the Sabbath a Mordecai in the gate his character and conduct expressing reverence for the law of God are a constant rebuke to those who have cast off the fear of the Lord and are trampling upon his Sabbath. The unwelcome intruder must by some means be put out of the way. I save these little notes when they touch my heart so that I can bring them up when I feel it's appropriate. And um, I feel like it's appropriate today. Anyways, um, the memory text is John 12, 35. Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. Isn't that true? Verse 37 says, that even after the people saw Jesus' miracles, they believed not. How stubborn is that? Right in plain sight, and they still didn't believe. My question is, are we doing the same? Um, when light is right in front of us, are we ignoring it? I hope not. Let's see. In the Bible's last book, Revelation, the devil is pictured as a dragon and a serpent. He is a dragon because he desires to destroy God's people and a serpent because he uses all his cunning lies to deceive them. In the years after Christ's death, thousands were tortured, 
thrown to lions and burned at the stake by Imperial Rome for refusing to worship its, de its deities. Yet in the face of this cruel punishment, many stayed faithful, the gospel continued to spread and the church grew. The Dark Ages was an example of what humanity turns to when they don't have the Bible to, to study and to live by. Um, cruel, cruel, inhumane, and godless were those times. But there were some who persevered and kept the Lord's commandments and he led them all the way through it. Um, Sunday, Satan's subtle strategy. Um, let's see. What Jesus says is true because he is the author of truth. Truth proceeds from the heart of an all-wise, all-loving, all-knowing God. He is the foundation of reality and of all truth. Truth is invaluable and clear understanding of wisdom, and wisdom are all from the Lord. Anything less is mistaken and faulty and corrupt. Compromise is a tool for Satan, subtle and cunning, Does anyone have any thoughts on that? What you are talking a little bit before, Satan try all the strategy to kill God's message, God's plans. And he tried with torture, but did not work that well because the number of Christians, when they were persecuted, they, the number grow. And I remember very well being in my country in the communist regime where the Christian doesn't matter what kind of Christian you are not welcoming anywhere you go. And the churches was full, full, full of Christians. Wow. Now, after the persecution is over, nobody persecutes the Christian. The churches are empty. Then we need to realize today we are not persecuted. And it's more in danger than if we are. Amen. Because Satan works just to compromise a little bit, and it's enough for him. Subtly, subtly corrupts. Yeah. Anybody else? Satan distorts God's word by convincing humans they can worship on any day of the week and God will still bless them. In a sense, it looks like they are blessed, but but by who and for how long is the question. Satan well knew that the Holy Scriptures would enable men to discern his deceptions and withstand his power. It was by the word that even the Savior of the world had resisted his attacks. At every assault, Christ presented the shield of eternal truth, saying it is written. To every suggestion of the adversary, he opposed the wisdom and power of the word in order for Satan to maintain his sway over men and establish the authority of the papal usurper, he must keep them in ignorance of the scriptures. Isn't that true? The Bible would exalt God and place infinite men in their true position. Therefore, its sacred truths must be concealed and suppressed. The logic was adopted by the Roman church for hundreds of years, the circulation of the Bible. 
was prohibited. The people were forbidden to read it or have it in their houses, and unprincipled priests and prelates interpreted its teachings to sustain their pretensions. Thus the Pope came to be almost universally acknowledged as the viscerant of God on earth, endowed with authority over church and state. What ways does Satan attempt to distort or misinterpret God's word today? Um, many, many ways. Many, many ways. Subtly, like Daniel was saying, um, he seeks to unsurp the word of God and lead us astray. Anybody else have any input on how Satan uh, attempts to distort or misinterpret God's word? Well, I, I think uh, today, um, the, as what you said earlier, and what Satan knows the scriptures back and forth. Better than us. Better than us. Yeah. He was around before the Bible was written. Yeah. He was in holiness. So his deception is to come as an angel of light, to take away these scriptures from people. If you take away the word, which is the truth, then people are to believe a lie. And since he's the father of lies, he's very cunning and deceptive. I think nowadays, I was listening to a, uh, a pastor, or a speaker, I should say, on uh, last Sunday. It was on in the on the TV in the morning, and he was on John chapter 5. Um, and he talked about, you know, the man and being healed. But I was waiting for him to get to the point of the Pharisees and the Sadducees on the Sabbath. He did talk about the Sabbath, but he referred to them as, okay, you guys are Old Testament, this is the new. And I'm listening, and I say, like, there's your, cue there's right your there. deception right there. Yep. I'm like, no, that was not the point. Yep. And so when people don't go to this, the scripture and they have someone tell me, well, that was the Old Testament. This is, this is the New Testament. And I said, you don't think that Jesus went to the synagogue on Sabbath? Sabbath was from creation. And I think the Sabbath is deceptive. People who go to these Catholic churches and pray in front of the Mother Mary is another exception. Yeah. Why would you pray to the mother of Jesus yeah. when Jesus told you how to pray and who to pray to? I am the way, the truth, and the light. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting when you listen to these preachers who, uh, I don't know, it's, it's getting easier for me to see, see the light in, and the darkness in between there their uh, words, the more I am educated and the more I educate myself on the word. Yeah. So Martin Luther said, when we know who that was, and he said the word of God and the word only. And so, you know, he fought that and he overcame that. And he was able to, you know, get the Bible written so that everybody can understand it. Because Satan had everything so twisted that, you know, everybody was believing his lie. And he made God look like a, not a loving God, a vengeful God that is out to get you. And this is the way Satan's lies and tempts people to think that. So he twisted God's character. And not only that, there's other things that he twisted to make you think that it's okay by the word and the word alone in the, in the scriptures, like the Sabbath also, he twisted around. Yeah. Yeah. Plus people uh, I, I'm, who don't read for themselves and study for themselves and just take the word of the preacher are going to be misled. Um, we are to test all preachers and pastors um, to see if for ourselves if they're um, straight. Go ahead, Bobby. Another 
uh, deception is going to be Sabbath versus Sunday in the end. It's not quite yet, but it's getting there. Absolutely. And what you said about uh, the legislature wanting to get things going about Sunday as the Sabbath, they call it uh, the Lord's Day or the false Sabbath. It is in the works right now. Absolutely. And uh, the only place in the Bible that tells you that Sunday is an abomination is in Ezekiel chapter 8, and I think it's verse 16 and 17. I see. Uh, you can all read it uh, on your own, and you can see where it says. Uh, God does not lie, and he cannot deceive you because his love for humanity, he's here to save us, not to destroy. We've got a destroyer. We don't need another one. Boy, so, the truth. Uh, and his word is also uh, authoritative in the world since he is the creator. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Savage wolves. Does someone want to read Acts 20, 27 through 32? Acts 20. I'll read it. Uh, Acts 20, 27 through 32. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd to the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I com commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. There's the warning right there, right? Even, even at that time, he was noticing that compromise was being brought into the church of God and was warning anyone and everyone about it. So now, thousands of years later, it's no different, even more intense nowadays than ever. And um, we need to be aware of this and test everything to the word of God so we won't be deceived ourselves. Um, what kind of compromises do we see entering the church today? Um, does anyone have any input on that? Well, I think the easiest way for Satan to get to what Paul was telling the people of Ephesus was exactly what's going on is the easiest way for Satan to dece deceive. He says, if, if someone, if Satan came in wearing horns and a pitchfork, we're going to know that, okay, this is Satan, you know, we got to get away from this guy over here. But he's coming in here looking good, talking the word, preaching. The most beautiful angel in The most beautiful angel. The most heaven, beautiful right? angel yep. And we're like, okay, well, 
Well, he, he looks like he follows Christ. Yeah. He acts like he follows Christ. Yeah. But then Paul is saying these guys are going to come up with, from uh, inside. That's right. You know? That's right. It's the art of war. He's destroyed yep. from the inside out. And so, um, and you see it in the Protestant churches nowadays where they recognize, they accept LBGTQ, which is not biblical, and it comes right into the church. And so they're compromising with the world. And when you compromise with the world, you're going right into darkness. Even the Adventist church. Even the Adventist church. Yeah. Daniel? Yes, and nowadays we need to be very careful because these infiltrations of little untruth here, a little bit there, make us not be a Christians like God wants us to be. And it's by testimony of Jesus and the word of God. If this doesn't fit in our life, and I want to mention a little bit sometime from our, the lesson teachers, the wolves come from our congregation too. Right from within. And I want to mention something. I was very stunned to hear that uh, Adventist pastor, Romanian pastor, but he's very well educated, very well. Andrews University finished it. He came with the idea that God created the world in seven and six thousand years, not in six days, because he argued. For God, one, ye one day is 1,000 years. And he said, it was not possible for God to create everything in one day, in six days. We need to be smart to understand what he wants to say. But the Bible and the testimony of Jesus said God created in six days. But you see, we need to be careful not to let our reason be smarter than God. We need to stick with the word of God the truth of God, and the testimony of Jesus. Amen. And we need to do that. Even to keep in the Sabbath, Satan said, oh, you can go to church on Sabbath, but the rest of the day you do whatever you want to do. You are still keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath is all day. It's not just two hours for the church. 24 hours. 24 yeah, hours. Yeah, and we need to be careful because little by little, somebody will come with a nice talk and... Uh, bring you a reason why you need you don't have to obey God 100 percent speaking smooth and things. what Satan wants to do to obey God but not 100 percent 95 percent and that what his strategy is not to say don't go to church anymore go but after that it's your time yeah isn't that true yeah I, I agree with that what Daniel was saying about uh you know, they said, he's trying to say that it took 6,000 years to, you know, create the world or whatever, but we serve a mighty powerful God, and, and we all know that he can do anything, and if he said he did it in one day, well, he, that's what he did, he did it in one day, he's that awesome and powerful to do that. He's taking the day year principle literally throughout the whole Bible, throughout the whole Bible, instead of... Um, yeah. 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 Um, we still have a few minutes. <laughs> I'd just like to say compromising, you know, what the scripture says. Even in our church, like before they said, there are some who says God is a loving God. And uh, he says, uh, God, about if you sin, you're going to be, you know, um, punished. And if you're righteous, you're going to be up in heaven. And they said, well, Ma, you are a, you are a mother. You have children. And if your children uh, will do something bad, will you kill them? I said, of course not. And uh, I said, because you're a mother, you love your, your uh, children. And uh, you're going to protect them. So, uh, but why does God then kill the you know, those, the wicked ones. 
And I said, God is a loving God, and he doesn't want that to happen to you. That's why he gives us the word, the Bible, to study that it's not God punishing us, but it's the result of sin, because sin is Amen. the transgression of the law. Amen. And God cannot, uh, you know, uh, stop you from it. He gives us the freedom to choose whether we choose to be with him or not to be with him. So it's really our own fault if we're not saved. But so we can be continuous doing the wicked thing and know that God doesn't approve it. So we have to change ourselves. And he gives us the opportunity and prompts our hearts to make that, to make that choice and those decisions. Isn't that something? But because God doesn't kill us right on the spot when we sin, he loves us and doesn't want, it, want us to die. He gives us many, many opportunities to come to him and repent. And um, that's just the God of love. That's, that's the God of love that wants us to be with him forever. Yeah. Yeah, uh, one time, David, if you remember, he, um, he was kind of depressed. And he said, uh, you know, God, everybody who does everything bad, all the sinners, they seem to all be getting ahead. Constantly, they get the most money, they get the best jobs, whatever it was, they get it all. But then the Lord said to him, but look in the books. Their names are not in the books of heaven. Amen. Then David better understood. There you go. Amen. 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 Sure enough. And we're being tested. We're being, we're being uh, honed and hewed for heaven. And we're going to take our characters to heaven. And this is why we need to have the characters of heaven to be translated. Safeguarded by the word. Does someone want to read John 17, 15 through 17? John 17. Okay, I'll read it. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth no matter what. No matter what. No compromising that ever. Um, and then Acts 20, 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. That's good news right there for all of us. Um, The Bible is the infallible revelation of God's will. It presents heaven's plan for humanity's salvation. Since all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness forever. That is, all scripture is inspired by God, not some parts or some parts more than others. The whole Bible must be accepted as the word of God Otherwise, the door is wide open for deception. Just like we were just talking about, Ron was just talking about. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, being safeguarded by the word, I think, is our only protection. And we have to ask for the Holy Spirit to understand Amen. and to guide us. Without the Holy Spirit, we're lost. We're going to use our own minds to try to decipher and have our own meanings. And when Satan went to Eve, 
And Eve says, yeah, we can't eat it. We're going to die. He straight up said, you're not going to die. So he just called God a liar. So and I think and when Jesus, when Satan went to Jesus and tempted him, how did Jesus answer Satan? For it is written. And so he answered everything that because he tried to miss quote the Bible, or he Twisted. did misquote the Bible, and yeah. Jesus just came right out with, it is written, this is what it says. Rebuked him. Rebuked him. Yep. And so I think that we, when we have the word, because the word is the truth, and there's a lamp on our feet, and a light to our path, that is the light that takes us from the darkness, is the word. Amen. Absolutely right. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Let's see. Read Psalm. Let's see. Psalms 119. Let's see what that says. The Bible clearly reveals God's infinite love in the light of the great controversy. It also exposes satanic delusions and reveals the devil's deceptions. Satan hates the word of God and has done everything possible throughout the centuries to destroy its influence. And the people that speak it in truth. Um, Psalms 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Right there. And then 116. Uphold me according to thy word that I may live and let me not be ashamed of my hope. There we go. Let's see, 160. Thy word is true from the beginning and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. There we go. What insights does the psalmist give us regarding the significance of God's word in the plan of salvation. That is, it is the infallible truth. There's no changing it, not ever. From beginning to end, there's no changing it. And it is our sure word of salvation. Let's see, human reasoning apart from scripture. The Holy Spirit works through our minds. He invites us to explore the mysteries of the universe. As someone has aptly stated, as Christians, we do not check our brains at the door of the church. Nevertheless, the brilliance of human reasoning alone is incapable of discovering the divine truths of scripture. Isn't that true? Truth is not a matter of human opinion. It is a matter of divine revelation. That is it right there in a nutshell. Um, Proverbs 16.25, does someone want to read that? There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Perfect example. Judges 21, 25. Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's interesting. Uh, like, like the kings were the infallible word, right? Um, they followed them blindly, um, even though they weren't always led by God. Anyways, we're running out of time here. Um, 
Why is the human mind, without the aid of the Holy Spirit, incapable of discovering divine truth? Because we are sin-infected humans who, without the Word, without the Lord, we are doomed. Doomed, doomed. And the Holy Spirit prompts every one of us to our knees in repentance. Just what we need. Anyways. Good morning. Bobby. Good to see you, buddy. Good, to see you. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Have another reading for the church in uh, 